As night falls across Britain, and we start to think about bed, there's a whole secret world that's just waking up. Tonight, we'll see it like never before, right through the night. Amazing creatures in our back gardens, on our city streets, in our zoos, in woods and fields. Usually, they're hidden by darkness, but not now. We're going to be following them throughout the night in a completely new way. Using special low-light camera technology, we can now reveal the animal stories our eyes can't see. Over three programmes, we're hoping to catch a glimpse of some of Britain's best-loved wildlife. We'll be up all night at a host of locations around the whole country, sharing their extraordinary lives as they unfold. We're going to lift the lid on the secret lives of British animals at night. Welcome to Nocturnal Britain. Tonight, behind the scenes at the zoo, Miranda witnesses how one creature's superpower senses could help her find a mate. They poo on prominent features in the landscape. I'm back in Gloucestershire at a hedgehog hospital hunting for deadly parasites. A little hedgehog cough may sound kind of cute, but it can be a sign of some pretty serious lung diseases. And Philippa is on hand to witness a tawny owl battling it out for the best nest spot in the garden. Miranda is down in Devon to discover a lone wolf banished for bad behaviour. It's already starting to get dark when I arrive at Wildwood near Exeter, where George has raised a pack of wolves since they were young. They are sophisticated pack animals, emotionally intelligent and highly social. In the wild, they're generally nocturnal hunters, relying on smell, so it's at night when they're most active. George. Hi, Miranda. Good, Good to, meet to meet you. you. Hi. Who have we got in here, then? Are there six of them? There's six Can of them in here. See? They're a oh. pack. Four brothers, two sisters. They're just over two years old now. Elvis, Moby, Sting, Lemmy, and the sisters, Katie and PJ. So all named after rock stars. After rock stars, yes. <laughs> Why very... was that, then? Well, it's because they're very cool and sexy, but they're also accomplished musicians. OK. Yeah. Except Moby, he's rubbish. Ooh. You can't say that on camera. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but this pack has a problem. And tonight, George is hoping to see if a recent fight within the pack can be resolved. Moby, one of the Wolf Brothers, is limping. Recently, we noticed that Moby had quite a serious injury and discovered he had actually broken his leg. Crikey. Moby was a victim of an attack by another wolf. George didn't see the fight, but there's one wolf who seems to have been cast out of the pack. George believes it can mean only one thing. The outcast, Sting, carried out the attack. In the wild, a lame wolf would be left behind, but this pack have rallied around the injured Moby. And it's Sting who's been sidelined. He looks like he's being totally left out. And he's clearly watching the others, yeah. watching what they're doing. The rest of the pack got between Sting and Moby and isolated Sting, relegated him to the bottom of the pack, perhaps whilst Moby recovers. Right, so they're actually looking after Moby and sort of ousting Sting a little bit. Yeah. To a wolf, relationships are critical. The pack do everything together. And it's the power of the pack that makes them so successful in the wild. It's quite heartbreaking to see it in sharp relief when the rest of the pack are, are clearly having a good time and enjoying themselves and engaging yeah. a lot of high energy play. Yeah. And he's not part of that. Sting approaches the others. He wants to be back in the pack, but they're not having any of it. Oh, it's good snarls. Look at that. Yeah. 
So when he snarls like that, you really see him baring his teeth. As an outcast, he risks being treated as an enemy by the rest. So it's important for Sting and for George that this spat is settled. George and I have a plan to bring the pack back together. Later on, I find out whether Sting is accepted back or remains a lone wolf. All across Britain, we're seeing how nocturnal animals make our own back gardens their homes, living just outside our windows under the cover of night. By staying up late, we can have astonishing relationships with them, revealing their secret lives. In one Stockport back garden, Christine has spent 13 years feeding the badgers almost every night. Did you see that? Yeah. She knows each one of them by name and can get close enough to bump fists with a badger. In this back garden in Worcestershire, Kate McRae recently built a giant badger set in the hope of attracting a family to stay permanently. Now completed, Kate is keen to show Philippa the badgers up close. When you watch one set of creatures, you get to know them and you get to notice behaviours and the more things you see, the more questions you ask. It pulls you in, it's really addictive um, because you want to know more. There's one thing sure to bring out the badgers at night. Food. So which direction will they come from? Well, they can literally come from any direction. animals, badgers use smell more than sight to find food. They are nervous eaters and the smell of people could have them running for the hills. Their eyesight isn't very good. They very rarely look up, their heads are down nearly all the time, so we're pretty safe as long as we keep still. On a cold, wet night, the badger understandably doesn't like to stick around. He's lightly gone back to Kate's homemade set, underground, out of sight. So it's probably a good time to go back inside to see what they're getting up to on the rest of the site. When the badger set was built, Kate rigged it inside and out with cameras to capture every move. Later, we find out what really happens when badgers go underground. Coming up, I'm visiting the Hedgehog Hospital, where I discover one of our hedgehogs could be carrying a parasite threatening all the hogs here. So this is the important bit. This is where we find out if this little hedgehog is healthy. And in Yorkshire, Miranda joins the search for a stoat called Bandita, who's in serious danger of being eaten if her coat doesn't change colour. The snow's gone now, so it's important she becomes brown and blends back into the environment. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. With our special low-light cameras, 
we're getting a view of Britain's nocturnal animals like never before. Tonight, I've come back to the Hedgehog Hospital, where I'm helping care for over 300 hedgehogs. Our hope is to release them back into the wild, but before they go, they need to be given a clean bill of health. One hog has us worried, not just for her, but for every animal here. This young lady in here has been of particular concern. Over the last couple of days, um, it's been noted that she has been sporadically coughing. And so I'm going to take a poo sample and we'll have a look and see what we can find under the microscope. Now, this is the glamour end of the industry. It certainly is. A little hedgehog cough may sound kind of cute, but it can be a sign of some pretty serious lung diseases. And that would be a massive setback for the recovery and release of this little hog. Lungworm is the most likely culprit for her cough. This hedgehog could be suffocating from eggs being laid in her throat. The best way to find out is to forage through our hedgehog's faeces. And guess who's got that job? Mashing smooth hedgehog poo. I tell you, this wasn't in the brochure. No, it never is. <laughs> I'm, I'm... How's that looking? That looks perfect. And then you take a cover slip, which is the very thin piece of glass. Yeah. And then you need to place that squarely over the top of that poo. So it's in the middle. Hooray, well done. And then you just pop a bit of pressure on it and spread it out. And then that just goes on on the microscope. And we're generally looking for one of those five um, parasites. parasites. Yeah. So this is the important bit. This is when we find out if this little hedgehog is healthy or has lungworm and is going to need a bit longer to stay here before it's released. So what are we seeing here? At the moment, I'm seeing a close-up of lots of little pieces of poo and nothing else, which is perfect. It's a clear sample. Hooray! Amazing news! Really good news. Luckily, it turns out she's clear and in a few days' time, she can be released. And for the other hedgehogs here, it's good news. There's no sign of a potentially dangerous parasite on the loose. I've been given special permission to go behind the scenes at one of Britain's top zoos. I'm here at Bristol Zoo with a great opportunity to find out what happens after opening hours when all the lights are turned out. Daytime animals like us use their eyes to see the world around them. But most nocturnal animals often have to rely on other senses. If you can't see, finding a potential partner can be tricky. But lots of our nocturnal animals here have developed a super sense to help them in the dark and I'm visiting one of them tonight. Bristol Zoo has an exciting new arrival, a quoll. Lucy the quoll has been brought in to help the breeding programme here at Bristol. It's vital the keepers know how Lucy's getting on looking for a partner. And bizarrely, we need to monitor her bowel movements. In the quoll dating game, there's nothing more seductive than a pile of poo they poo on prominent features in the landscape. So tonight we're keeping a special eye on Lucy to see if she poos or not and what she thinks of the rest of the poo in her new territory. Their poo carries a lot of chemical signals that help quolls mark their territory. And importantly for Lucy, it tells her who in the group is a potential partner. She's just been sniffing over by the door over there, really sort of trying to get as much information from that poo as possible. Um, and this is just a great sign. It means that she's settling in, she's feeling really happy, really comfortable. That's good news. It'll be a while before we know if Lucy is going to mate, but so far, the signs are good. At night, as some animals are looking for the perfect partner, others are just out for a good time. This isn't the Serengeti, 
It's a zoo in Somerset. Mchanga and Juna are two young male African elephants. African elephants need as little as three hours sleep, so even though they aren't officially nocturnal, they're up most of the night. Tonight, rather than sleeping, the young elephants are sparring each other to test their strength. At least there's CCTV here to keep an eye on them. Here at Bristol Zoo's Twilight World, all of the animals are really well adapted to life in the dark, but one of the strangest creatures here is the eye eye. This nocturnal creature has giant dishes for ears and a witch's broom for a tail. But for all its quirky traits, the weirdest has to be its scratchy, skeletal fingers. In their native Madagascar, these creatures of the night have a fearsome reputation. People believe that at the dead of night, eye eyes creep into people's homes and use their long skeletal middle finger to pick away at the hearts of their victims. Whilst they do look scary, eye eyes don't hunt humans, just insects. Tahiri and Kambara are twin sister eye eyes. In the wild, eye eyes hunt at night over rotting logs and branches. They use their long fingers to tap the wood and can tell from the sound if anything edible is inside. All those adaptations are crucial for a life spent hunting at night. The keepers here are going to feed the eye eye girls tonight as close to their natural way as possible. One bamboo log full of tasty insects. Now, it's going to be quite interesting when they put that in. Are the twins going to work together? Is there going to be a bit of sisterly love going on and they can cooperate together to try and get at what's inside? Or are they going to compete and one of them's going to get to the tasty treat? Ai Ai's usually like to be alone. It's rare to have twins together like this. Wow, there's one on it straight away. That's quick. If the sisters work together, they'll chew through the bamboo and get to the food at twice the speed. But the competition for these tasty grubs is too tempting for teamwork. It's not long until a defensive nudge from one of them pushes the log onto the floor and out of reach of them both. If the girls can't work together, they may both have to go without. Filming your own garden wildlife can be as simple as putting a small collar camera on your cat, hunkering down with a mobile phone, or setting remote cameras in discreet locations in the garden. They can all reveal incredible stories taking place under cover of darkness. Some people go much further to get the perfect view and it can become an obsession, as Miranda found out in a back garden in Yorkshire. This is a wildlife garden to die for. Everywhere you look, there are mini film sets designed to attract in animals and make them feel safe and secure. So this entire area has been devoted to stoats. The log pile here gives them places to tunnel and burrow in. There's water for them to play in. There are cameras set up to capture all the action that goes on. There are nest boxes and feeding stations and even a maze for the stoats to play in. Somebody has clearly had quite a lot of fun here. It's a very elaborate and high-tech setup. There's one particular animal I've come here to see tonight, and she's a stoat called Bandita, named after her distinctive Zorro-like mask. The man behind all of this is Robert Fuller. He's even gone to some extreme lengths to get access to his stoat hide. I haven't got the speed that you had, Rob. <laughs> no, it's good for your arms. <laughs> oh, amazing. That's so much fun. <laughs> But is that really necessary? I oh, mean, yeah. it's good fun, but surely the, you can just use the door. Yeah, I used to use the door, but the stoats would uh, smell to come in sometimes and the stoats would be gone, but using the tunnel, it's absolutely brilliant. 
I'm hoping to see Bandita tonight, but early signs aren't promising. We've had a really special winter watching this particular set. She was actually pure white uh, a few weeks ago. She's been completely white. Yeah, yeah, pure white. Yeah. We've had a bit of snow over winter, and uh, that's why they turn white to blend in with the uh, winter landscape. Come spring, they always change brown, and that's very important because they're so cons conspicuous. When everything turns lush green, you've got a bright white stoat. It just doesn't blend in. Rob shows me this footage of Bandita. It was taken just a week ago. He hasn't seen her for a few days now and is worried. It's critical she changes to brown or she'll be a prime target for predators. Coming up, a brutal battle for the best nesting site in the back garden. Boxes like this are prime nesting spaces and there's always competition for them. A Miranda gets to see if the wolves' family problems can be solved. One thing seeing them in the daylight, but at night, oh, yeah. wow. We've got an amazing opportunity to see Britain's nighttime wildlife as never before, using new technology. Miranda is back at the zoo, hoping for a chance to see for herself the strange eating habits of the exotic eye eye. But first, she has a chance to see more of what's happening behind the scenes in the middle of the night. I'm going to be meeting some more of the nocturnal animals who come from right around the world, but who call this place their home. These charming little fellas are African penguins and it is breeding season for them at the moment. So each of the pairs here will have laid an egg in the nest boxes. Keeping an egg warm is a matter of life or death for an unborn chick. So these penguin parents give round the clock care. We've got half the adults inside in the nest boxes incubating those eggs. And the other half are on night patrol keeping watch on me. So there's an adult just emerging from the nest box here and then they'll swap over and take it in turns to incubate. For penguin parents, it's 24-hour shift work, swapping duties day and night. For all the nocturnal animals in the zoo, caring for their young is a basic instinct and one that being awake at night actually helps with. Even the fiercest predators are vulnerable when they're first born. Leopards are supreme nocturnal hunters, so now they should be active, not looking to lie down. But tonight in a Yorkshire zoo is a very special night. Tonight, this leopard is giving birth. Many animals prefer to have their babies under the cover of darkness. It's safer for the vulnerable young. There are only 80 of this critically endangered species left in the wild, so even one cub is a success. But she's not finished. Soon, there are three new Amur leopards. Our leopard will be staying up, cleaning her precious cubs and feeding them milk. This rare event all captured on camera in the depths of the night. Back in Bristol, I've been keeping an eye on the eye eyes. 
Their elongated fingers are perfectly formed to winkle food out of seemingly impossible places. Earlier, we set twin sister eye eyes Tahiri and Kambara a challenge. Keeper Paige has hidden insects and grubs in a log. Wow, there's one on it straight away. That's quick. We wanted to see if these notorious loners could work together. But we got our answer pretty quickly. And it's a no. We try again. This time, we hang the food filled log from a tree. One of the sisters goes up to it straight away. God, Tahiri's really going for it, isn't she? Yeah. She knows what's in there. It's definitely when that food went in, Tahiri was there first, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. She was very dominant about the fact that this yeah. was her food and she wasn't going to share it. Tahiri looks like she's really getting that finger in her whole of her claw yeah. right on that hole, hasn't she? And you can sort of see that she's really feeling inside that. Yeah, to get yeah. Her so you can really kind of out. see how long it is when they do it. The eye eye's hand is much like ours, except for one finger, which is nearly as long as their arm. This finger has special joints which allow it to swivel in any direction. So even while hanging on a branch, an eye eye can use this flexible finger to pluck out grubs with deadly accuracy. The eye eyes have incredible adaptations for their nocturnal lifestyle, but teamwork isn't one of them. Just spending time looking at them, they really are the weirdest mishmash of a whole load of other different animals, but all those adaptations are crucial for a life spent hunting at night. No British night is ever truly silent. If you listen carefully, you may well hear the calls of animals off in the darkness, including owls. Our most common species is the tawny, and across the country, from parks to gardens, they can be heard twit-wooing and out looking for places to nest. In the Midlands, Philippa caught up with a pair of tawnies looking to hold on to some prime real estate. Back in our back garden in Worcestershire, Kate has rigged a nesting box that's become a battleground. It's the perfect place to bring up young, so every animal is after it. With Kate's cameras, Philippa can spend the night in comfort, watching what's going on inside the box as it happens. Currently, it's occupied by a tawny owl. So this is the second year she's nested here in this nest box. They sleep during the day and head out hunting at night. But this tawny owl is going nowhere this evening. She's expecting. Oh, look, you can see the eggs. Yeah. Look, 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 look. There we oh. go. She might look content now, but last year it was a real battle to get her nest box. First, the grey squirrels occupied the box. They were restless and often resorted to fighting. Then, they were gazumped by a pushy family of jackdaws. When our tawny was looking to lay her eggs, she was having none of it. and ate the baby jackdaws. This year, she has secured the box early. Now, she's brooding a family of her own. And last week, she laid her third egg here. So she's at one week into incubation. She's utterly beautiful, isn't she? She is absolutely beautiful. She will remain in that position for 30 days now. It's 30 day incubation. She will hardly move from that spot. Um, during the day, she'll just sleep. And the male, it's up to him to basically provide for himself because he needs to keep fit and healthy. 
and to provide for her. Last year, she successfully raised two owlets. When they first hatch, these chicks are really tiny. As Kate's cameras revealed last year, these owls showed themselves to be a great mum and dad, bringing their owlets a wide variety of dinners. Field mice, goldcrest, and a hard to swallow frog. How long will they have then between the chicks hatching and fledging? Tawnies are pretty unique in the fact that they leave the box way before they can really fly properly, and it's called branching. In fact, last year, our eyelets fell out of the box. But this year, her eggs are still a few weeks away from hatching, so tonight, our female tawny owl is alone, keeping her eggs warm. I guess there's nothing for her to worry about. She's really safe and snug in there. She doesn't even have to worry about getting some food because hubby's going to bring that in for her. You might think that, but there are still risks. Having boxes like this are prime nesting spaces, and there's always competition for them. Squirrels are probably the only one I worry about at this stage. Earlier in the day, when the tawny was sleeping, Kate's cameras caught a squirrel trying to muscle in on the nest box. But even a bullish squirrel won't beat a tawny owl backed into a corner. Earlier on, Miranda got a chance to spend time with some wolves in the West Country. I've been following a wolf pack in Devon as they worked out their hierarchy struggles and watched as young wolf Sting tried to deal with being excluded. And I hope Sting would be welcomed back into the gang. Sting's attack on another wolf means while the rest of the pack are playing together, he is excluded. It's quite heartbreaking to see it in sharp relief when the rest of the pack are clearly having a good time and enjoying themselves and engaging yeah. a lot of high energy play. Yeah. And he's not part of that. So, it's time to put our plan into action. In the wild, wolves hunt as a pack, following scent trails. Hopefully, by setting them a task which mimics what they do in the wild, we can encourage them to band together, bringing Sting back into the pack. Earlier in the day, in another section of the enclosure, we laid a scent trail to a stash of fish. And now, at night, it's time for the wolves to hunt. We hope they'll work together to find the food and forget their differences. Obviously, it's really dark in there, so George and I are going to be watching the behaviour on this specialist low light level camera here. And this is really exciting because they've never done anything like this before. The wolves are released into the fish filled enclosure. They look really ghostly, don't they? Yeah. One thing seeing them in the daylight, but at night, oh. In the wild, wolves work together as a team, sniffing the ground for scent trails, which could lead them to potential prey. One of the females has locked onto the scent. It's hard to conceive of how um, detailed and complex a wolf's sense of smell is. It is probably as complex as sight is for a, a human. They're using their extraordinary sense of smell and very quickly find the fish. We've appealed to their wild side, but George's plan doesn't seem to have worked. Sting has stayed in the other enclosure. But as dawn approaches and the rain sets in, I see something unexpected. Is one of those Sting? One of them is Sting, yes. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? It seems missing out on a fish supper is punishment enough for Sting. Well, that 
looks nice and relaxed all yeah. of a sudden. When we started this evening, uh, Sting was very much at the bottom of the pile. Yeah. And moments ago, he was, you know, uh, relaxing with the rest of the pack. The pack seem to know they're stronger together and put the past behind them. And I have to say, that's the most incredible way to spend an entire night just watching a pack of wolves. Coming up, Philippa gets a unique view underground, thanks to a Big Brother-style badger set. <laughs> she's not getting up for anyone. No, she's dead to the world. And Miranda's back in Yorkshire to see if she can find the stoat bandita and see if her coat has turned. The snow's gone now, so it's important she becomes brown and blends back into the environment. All over the country, we're following the stories of some of Britain's favourite nocturnal animals through the night. In one back garden in Worcestershire, wildlife enthusiast Kate has recently built a giant underground badger set. She took Philippa to see one of the young badgers who now call this back garden home. The badger left after a few minutes, but the show's not over because even underground, Kate's got eyes on these badgers. Back at the house, cameras stream footage from her set to the computer. Oh, Aww, there we go. Look. <laughs> so who is this? This looks like one of our youngsters. See, quite a rounded Isn't body. Great. Oh, beautiful. What a poser. Great. The set initially lay empty, but after a few months, Kate's cameras finally caught a pair of badgers sniffing around. It turned out the visitors were a mother and two young sons. Once the badgers looked interested, Kate put out straw as fresh bedding to encourage them to settle in fully. They started to pour that material in. As soon as they started doing that, I felt they were beginning to get ownership. I love the way that they scoop it all up with their front legs into like a ball between their chin and their front legs, and then they scoop it into their middles, and then they sort of arch their back and go backwards. And what is amazing, they always go straight back into the hole. Yeah. Like they've got reversing Didn't even camera. Look behind. <laughs> I know. It was only when the nesting material Kate left out was taken in that she knew all her hard work building the set had paid off. And she got to see the intimate lives of badgers underground. So how old was he there then? I think about six, seven months here. <laughs> she's not getting up for anyone. No, she's, she's dead to the world. In time, Mum moved out to start a new family. For the two brothers left in the set, it now became a place of their own. These guys are old enough now to fend for themselves. So the youngsters are now on their own. And they're quite happy here. They've got their own sort of bachelor pad. And when you see them in here, they'll often sleep together, so be snuggled up together. But they also do a lot of grooming. This mutual grooming is a really important part of their lives. Apart from simple hygiene, grooming strengthens the social bonds. Tonight, it's not all badger bliss, though. As with any siblings, they don't always get on. So you can see a lot of rolling around, pushing each other, bickering. It's really just playful, <laughs> very boisterous. Philippa has had a fantastic insight into the life of badgers above and below ground at night, all down to the dedication of Kate 
and her cameras. I'm in Yorkshire, trying to catch sight of a stoat called Bandita. Earlier, Rob showed me footage from a few weeks ago. I could see Bandita's distinctive Zorro markings, but also that she was still in her white winter coat. But there's no snow to camouflage her now, so she should turn brown for spring to stay hidden from predators. But wildlife artist Robert is worried that this hasn't happened yet. Now Rob is hoping to see Bandita again to check on her progress. We've tried the hide, but had no luck. So we've moved into the house to find an incredible array of cameras to help us on our search. This setup is amazing, Rob. Because you can just sit here and watch everything on a computer screen. It's amazing. Yeah, we're not missing a, a moment. There's a lot of cameras out there that are covering where the stoats travel. Rob shows me footage he took of Bandita a few weeks ago to help me recognise her. She is so white, isn't she? Mm. But tonight, there's still no sign of Bandita. I can see why Rob's worried. He hasn't spotted her in two weeks with all these cameras, and he's worried she could have been caught by a predator. All we can do is wait and hope. Finally, as the sun starts to rise, Bandita makes an appearance. And she's in a brand new summer coat. been a great evening and it's always a rare treat to see an animal that is as elusive as a stoat. It's 6 a.m. The dawn chorus is in full voice and the sky is getting lighter by the second. For me and for the nocturnal animals, our night has come to an end. But for the rest of the zoo, the day is just about to begin. The hidden world of what goes on through the night is just unbelievable if we only stuck around to watch. As we're waking up, our nocturnal animals are bedding down for the daylight hours leaving only hints of what happened during the night. I've satisfied my otter obsession. Absolutely brilliant. And I got up close with badgers. I mean, it's like she could come in and sit on your sofa. <laughs> Seen how barn owls can hunt in total darkness. Oh, yes. And how wolves settle a score. It's nice and relaxed, yeah. all of a sudden. In zoos across the country, we've witnessed intimate moments. And amazing ways animals adapt to a life at night. But you don't have to go to the zoo to see nocturnal wildlife. It's happening in Backyard Britain right outside our windows. That's amazing. On our patios and in our gardens. There's so much going on if we only look. So next time you're thinking of diving under the duvet, draw back your curtains. You never know what you might see.